In the U.S. House, incumbent Andy Barr faces Democrat Amy McGrath. The debate courtesy of Kentucky Educational Television. Live coverage on C-SPAN. Welcome to Kentucky Tonight. Good evening, I'm Renee Shaw, and thank you so very much for joining us. Tonight, we're discussing the issues facing the 6th Congressional District in Kentucky. The candidates in the 6th District race are Congressman Andy Barr, James Gramalek, Frank Harris, retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath, and Ricka L. Wallen. Joining us tonight are incumbent Republican Congressman Andy Barr of Lexington, Libertarian Frank Harris of Lexington, and Democrat Amy McGrath of Georgetown. We invite your questions and comments tonight. Join the conversation on Twitter at KYTonightKET and on Facebook Live. Send email to KYTonight at KET.org. Use the web form at KET.org slash KYTonight. Make sure to check the box that says you're not a robot or give us a call at 1-800-494-7605. Please include your first and last name and town or county on all messages. Candidates, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We appreciate it. Let's get right to it. A lot to cover in one hour. Let's start with you, Ms. McGrath. Sure. Uh, in ads either by or on behalf of Mr. Barr, the tagline is, is that you're too liberal mm. for Kentucky. There is a playback of a recording which we hear your voice and the words say that you are further left, more progressive than anyone in the state of Kentucky. Are your values and your vision for the 6th District out of step and out of touch with what the voters would want? Well, you know what? I care about American values. And um, to, to get right to it, you know, I think that um, taking people's words out of context and um, throwing them back at, uh, at your opponent uh, is essentially lying about them. You're misrepresenting what, what I've said. And if Congressman Barr would actually release uh, the entire tape of that, uh, what you would probably see um, is that I was talking about one issue. What was the issue? And um, I don't know, since he won't release the tape, um, but most likely it was um, probably trying to explain to people that, you know, you can't put folks in a box. And on many issues, uh, I'm very conservative, and on some issues, I'm very liberal. And that's just who we are as Americans. And, you know, I just feel like uh, when you do these, these negative attack ads that um, really divide us even more, uh, you're incapable of talking about the issues yourself. So you have to play snippets from your opponent and use it against them. Uh, I, I think it's just really um, not what our country needs right now, and it's really sad. There are some that are concerned that if you were elected to represent the 6th District in Washington, that you might eventually kowtow to the uh, <laughs> left Democratic establishment. Yeah. Would you make some assurances that that would not be the case? Well, I think it's important to remind viewers that um, the Democratic establishment didn't want me to run. You know, they uh, uh, backed my opponent in the primary, and I don't know anybody anything. <laughs> Um, and I think it's also important to note that in my campaign, um, it's funded by people uh, and small dollar donors. Ninety percent of the donations to my campaign are fifty dollars or less. And so when somebody donates to my campaign, they're not handing me draft legislation, unlike, unfortunately, the current congressman in the seat. Congressman Barr, I want to ask you, the polling aggregation site 538 finds that you have voted 97 percent of the time for measures that are supported by President Trump. Are Republican policy victories such as the tax cuts, the humming along of the economy, the easing of some regulations aided by the Trump White House, is all that worth overlooking the controversies that continue to swirl this Trump White House from indictments to his deportment? Well, first of all, Renee, thank you and KET for hosting this debate. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel McGrath, thank you for your service. And to, to Mr. Harris, thank you for your contribution to the discussion. Um, it's, it's my honor to represent the people of this district. And over the last uh, several years in particular, where we've been in a position um, at the epicenter of some of the most significant economic and national policy decisions facing our country, I can tell you with great confidence uh, that we're getting results and the American people are better off now. Um, you know, I, I think that it's important that we talk about the results that we're getting and we've done that. We've done that in eight TV ads and I wish we had more debates like this and I thank KET for holding them because we would have been able to get into more substantive discussions about the differences that we have um, on these issues. And I think it's very legitimate 
and not just to talk about the record uh, of success on tax cuts, on deregulation, on bipartisan work that I've delivered on uh, to increase access to the financial system that has resulted in a booming economy and the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. And the work we've done, the bipartisan work we've done on the 21st Century Cures Act, and the bipartisan work we've done to provide a record level of investment in medical research that's helped the University of Kentucky, Sanders uh, Brown Center on Aging, and the Markey Cancer Center, and the record amount of investment that we've made in combating the opioid uh, epidemic, including uh, my legislation to provide transitional housing for addiction recovery, neonatal abstinence syndrome, more uh, funding for law enforcement. As a result, our communities are safer and healthier. And the work we've done, bipartisan work we've done, to make the country more secure, reinvesting in our military, rebuilding in the military, um, reforming the VA, historic reform of the but VA. is all of that, Congressman Barr, worth overlooking some of the missteps of the Trump administration and the indictments and the misconduct that many think the president often exhibits? Well, no, no. Nobody, uh, nobody tolerates any misconduct, of course, but the, the point is that we are getting results for the people of this district. This is a booming economy. People have greater confidence. Uh, there's more jobs. Uh, the uh, Wages are growing. Paychecks are growing. The, the, our communities are safer. Our communities are healthier. Our, our nation is stronger. And we're doing it in a bipartisan way. Despite this narrative from the other side, despite this narrative uh, that somehow uh, I uh, am, uh, am partisan, the reality is that I routinely work across uh, the aisle to get things done for the people of this district, whether it's chairing the bipartisan Congressional Horse Caucus, whether it's going to a, a, a weekly bipartisan meeting, whether it's uh, in my capacity as chairing the subcommittee with jurisdiction over the Treasury Department's implementation of sanctions. And we'll come back Pat, to some of those other but, but parts of your But just record. to finish the point, Every single Democrat in the House of Representatives voted for my legislation that was the toughest economic sanctions ever directed at North Korea. You know, that is, okay, get, that is right getting we'll results. Get to more That's of that not rhetoric. a little later on. Mr. Harris, to you, uh, you're up against some very well-resourced challengers in this race. So what does your candidacy bring to this contest and what kind of congressman would you be if elected? Renee, I want to say first, thank you very much for having me here. And, you know, the Libertarian Party is a small party. We only have 8,500 members. We have, we have made small incremental gains over the years. I left the Republican Party six years ago because I could no longer tolerate the things that I saw that were wrong in the Republican Party. And the Democratic Party has similar problems. But what I saw in the Republican Party was they talked about balancing budgets but when they have control of the White House, the Senate, and the House, they don't balance the budget. Um, the, the Democrats promise things that they don't deliver on. So I left the Republican Party because of those frustrations. What I see is that Americans in general are concerned about fundamental things like overspending. A big part of my campaign has been about, I want to balance the budget. I want to address the debt. These are things that ordinary people believe in, and they're not seen from the two major parties. There are more people now than ever before that are registered independent or third party. 10% of the population now is registered independent Another five, in Kentucky. Another 5% is registered third party. Those are the people that are going to watch me. Those people are more issue driven. They're not doing what their party tells them to do. They are looking for answers for themselves. So I'm the guy that wants to reduce spending. I'm the guy that wants to return America to a constitutional footing. The, the federal government has not followed the Constitution okay. for far too long, and they need to. Thank you, Mr. Harris. So let's talk about, unfortunately, we're going to take a pivot to the week's events of last week that were stunning and tragic in many ways. Thirteen pipe bombs sent to prominent Democrats in a CNN and critics of the president. Uh, two African Americans were assassinated by white men at a Kroger just right outside of Louisville. The assailant had also tried, we learned, to enter a black church. And federal prosecutors have filed uh, hate crime charges against a Pennsylvania man who stormed into a Pittsburgh synagogue on Saturday and killed 11 people and wounded four police officers. The gunman had made anti-Semitic statements uh, during the shooting and, and targeted Jews on social media. So given the controversies uh, and the conversations that are happening all across this country about the demise and civility uh, that many believe incites this anger and some of these hateful actions, what are you committed to doing, Congressman Barr? What are you personally committed to doing to restore civility and American political discourse? 
Well, our thoughts go to all of these uh, victims of these tragedies. And in fact, uh, just today I talked to Rabbi um, um, here who, who uh, is over the Jewish Student Center at the University of Kentucky and uh, offered my thoughts to the, the, the community, the Jewish community here uh, because of the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, terrible situation up there. You know, we all as leaders have an obligation to try to elevate the discourse and to, to promote civility. And, you know, just this weekend, I was so proud um, that my staff and I were joined by uh, my constituents in Jessamine County and descendants of slaves from Camp Nelson in, uh, uh, in, in Jessamine County, Kentucky, a site where it was really the only avenue for enslaved Kentuckians to achieve their emancipation. And uh, this has been a project that we've been working on um, for five years. And through a lot of hard work and persistence and working with this administration, we were able to bring and secure for Kentucky and the 6th Congressional District the first ever national monument designation for Camp Nelson. Now that's a symbolic thing, but it elevates, it elevates a story of, from our past, mm -hmm. from our from American history, a time in our history where we were even more divided than we are now, arguably, and um, where we overcame. So how can you take that valiance of getting that designation and transfer that to Washington and make a difference in the political discourse? Well, like I said before, you know, to me, we, we are all striving to represent, and I currently have the privilege uh, to represent uh, the hardworking people of Central and Eastern Kentucky in Congress. It's been a privilege and an honor to do so. And it's no secret that this is a very competitive swing congressional district because it's a very diverse district. I think the diversity of this district with an urban liberal core, moderate suburban voters, and very conservative rural voters, it makes me a better congressman. The fact that I've been accessible and I've listened to everybody, uh, my constituents don't always agree with the way I vote um, on the right and on the left, and I get that. Um, but it's made me a better congressman because this district is more diverse and is, is emblematic of the whole country, unlike many of my colleagues, frankly, on the right and on the left. Um, so it's a real privilege to represent this district and to work in a bipartisan breakfast group and to have discussions. And my record reflects that I've been able to cross the aisle, despite these partisan these, mm -hmm. these partisan attacks based on, uh, on percentages that don't reflect the actual body of my work, which has been extraordinarily bipartisan. I've been rated the most bipartisan member of the Kentucky congressional delegation. My work demonstrates it. It's not rhetoric, it's getting results across Ms. the aisle. Ms. McGrath, so your opinion on civility and political discourse, and if elected, yeah. what would you do to change the tenor and tone of the conversations sure. that happen? And, and let me take a step back and, and of course acknowledge what happened over the weekend is absolutely terrible and to the Jewish American community um, and the communities in, uh, in Louisville as well. I, I just think, you know, this is why I'm running. Uh, I saw the instability in our country in 2016. I was teaching at the U.S. Naval Academy. I was teaching our future military officers. And one of the things I learned was that they had lost faith in their political leadership to tell the truth, um, to be civil, to not for political reasons um, demonize the other side. And I'm afraid to say that I, I fear it's getting worse. Um, how do you fix it? And that's your, yeah, that's your question. You know, how, how do we fix it? You know, in the Marine Corps, what I learned about leadership, real leadership, was leadership by example. And so I've tried to run a campaign that doesn't um, label the other side with 15 negative attack ads, most of which lie about their opponent, doesn't uh, play into the rhetoric that's hurting our country. That's what le real leaders do. We rise above it, and we do it not just with words, not just with words, we do with actions. And that's the kind of leader I'm gonna be. Look at the campaign I've run. It's been positive, it's been substantive. I haven't demonized the other side. I've tried to come together and listen to people. I talk a lot about the fact that, you know, I'm a Democrat and I'm a proud Democrat, but I like to listen to everybody. And I, I do not, I will not, get into the mud like my opponent has. That's how we, that's how we overcome quick this. Response to that. If, if I may respond, because I, I agree with civility, and I have run eight, nine positive ads. We've had positive ads in newspapers, but I have to address this narrative that somehow my opponent is running a positive campaign. The very first ad that my opponent ran was a negative attack on me. It said that 
I was handpicked by a United States senator. Now, aside from the fact that that's totally disconnected from basic uh, American civics, uh, it is a slap in the face to the 202,000 central Kentucky voters who did pick me to represent them. Furthermore, the ad continues by, by putting out this absurd negative attack, false attack, that has been repeated in this campaign by my opponent, that I want to take health care away from a quarter of a million Kentuckians. The truth of the matter is, I voted to end the government's coercion of people to force them to buy a product that they don't want and that they cannot afford. That is not taking anything away from people. That is giving American families the ability to choose what's right and for them. And, and one other point, if I could, Renee. Real quickly, please, and, sir. And, and the, the other point is, you've got this other ad now that features this, this nice lady, Nancy, and someone has told her that I voted for an age tax a negative attack. There's no age tax. The only the only age tax is Obamacare, which raises health care costs for all Americans of all ages. And there's another Nancy that my constituents need to know about that are, that's behind that ad. And that's Nancy Pelosi, who is funding this attack ad against me. So, you know, with all due respect, nobody should be under the false impression that that my opponent has some, somehow run this pristine, positive campaign. I, I get it. People don't like negative attacks. And, and attack campaigns, but I have, I have attended eight forums to have a substantive debate, and my opponent has refused to show up at all of these communities to have a substantive debate uh, about the real issues in this campaign. Okay, let me go to Mr. Harris real quickly on a couple of quick comments about civility and political discourse. Sure. You know, what I see is that when I'm in person with somebody, I treat them completely differently than if I'm talking to them on Facebook and disagreeing with them on Facebook. When you see somebody face to face and you can look into their eyes and see what they're feeling and, and see the nuances of their expression and everything, you treat people differently. I find that when people in person are much nicer than people on Facebook. And so I think a lot of people, they only get their source of news from one source. And when people, um, are only getting one source of information, quite often they're getting bad information. I try to find whatever I think the truth is. I, I, wanna, I wanna know what the truth is. And I think the media, not KET, but the media in broad, a broader sense, is very guilty of choosing one side or the other and portraying a, na a, a narrative which is completely false. I've seen so many stories that I felt like I knew what the actual truth was and I would go to one channel and see something that made it sound one way and then another channel that made it sound completely the other way. You have to dig and find out what the truth okay, is. Thank but you. we yes. need to treat yes. each other like people. Right, okay, let's get to some of those issues, healthcare being one of them. So I have this question, a web form message uh, that's come in to us tonight uh, on social media. Uh, it says that, a uh, question to Congressman Barr, uh, on social media your opponent's party is claiming you have done nothing in regards to medical care except destroy Obamacare. Other than the subject of Obamacare, what can you tell the undecided voter that you have done to advance and make health care better for Kentuckians during your time in office? Great question. And, you know, uh, there is a, a narrative that um, the only thing that Congress ever talks about is Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, which is admittedly a very uh, divisive issue in this country right now. It's a big raging debate about what we should do about uh, health care. I, I certainly don't want to just repeal the law and go back to the status quo. We need, we owe it to our... So you our, wouldn't vote again for repeal, as Senator Mitch McConnell well, what, said he may do after the midterms? What we need to do is replace it. That's what I voted for. We certainly need to repeal the parts that are making life harder <laughs> for people, the skyrocketing costs of the increase in the premiums, the increase in the deductibles, the fact that we have narrow networks, the, the fact that my constituents have lost their health plans. People with pre-existing conditions so have lost their access to So you're committed, as well as a lot of other Republicans, are saying during this campaign season that they're ch shifting that narrative to say they're for protecting the pre-existing condition. Well, of course, classes. we've always been. I mean, my, my, we've always been. Uh, my, my sister has a pre-existing condition. No, the, the bill that we voted for to replace Obamacare put in statute protections far beyond the Affordable Care Act for people with pre-existing conditions. But, but let me go back to the, the, the larger point. Putting aside the, the very contentious debate over the Affordable Care Act. This Congress has been a Congress of action and results on health care. The, the bipartisan 21st Century Cures Act, historic record investment in the National Institutes of Health for diabetes and cancer and childhood cancer and Alzheimer's research, the opioid epidemic, historic levels of investment for addiction recovery uh, in, uh, in combating that issue. 
uh, reauthorization and increase of the community health centers. Uh, yeah. The community. The, well, I want to come back to those those issues, but I want to stick very, really quickly with the Affordable Care okay. Act, Ms. McGrath. There's a lot of issues. Uh, there. There's a lot of issues there, and we have such limited time. So, excuse me for interrupting, uh, Ms. McGrath. Uh, you have said that uh, that we should not get rid of Obamacare; that you should fix it. How would you do that? And then the second part of that question is: you have also said you favor the public option. So, I want you to comment on those two sure. things and how many people say the public option option is a trojan horse for a single-payer system. So answer those sure. points, please. Well, first of all, let me start by saying I believe health care is a right, uh, not a privilege, uh, not something that only the wealthiest 1% or the wealthiest folks can, that can afford it uh, should have. It is absolutely a right, and we need to make sure that all Americans can have access to affordable and accessible health care. And the biggest thing that I've said in the campaign, and this isn't just me, this is the voters of the 6th District, who this is their number one issue, is that a lot of people like the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, there isn't a day that goes by, not a day that goes by in this campaign where somebody doesn't come up to me and say, you know, the Affordable Care Act saved my life, or I have a pre-existing condition, and I am scared that, that, that Republicans, that politicians in office are going to continue to try to undermine the Affordable Care Act, continue to try to throw people under the bus who have pre-existing conditions. And this is the problem with politicians like Andy Barr, um, with the congressman. You know, his, he talks about his repeal and replace plan. Uh, your replace plan, you know, the American Medical Association, if you don't believe me on how bad it was, believe the American Medical Association when they said it violates their most basic principle of do no harm first. I mean, this is the, the doctors, the nurses, the AARP, the American Pediatrics Association, they were all against the replacement plan because it would have thrown people off the health care. So yes, this is personal. But two, I think going forward, we need to, number one, elect leaders who want to make the system work, not try to undermine it for purely political purposes. That's number one. But number two, hey, let's, let's do things like a Medicare buy-in plan for those who are 55 and older. What it would do is people could buy into a system that they already seem to generally like. It would take some of the uh, burden off the Affordable Care Act exchanges. That's, that's a good idea. Another good idea, as you mentioned, is the public option. This is something that was put into the Affordable Care Act and taken out at the last minute. What would it do? Under the Affordable Care Act exchanges, you now have a choice of one or two or three private insurers. I propose you also have, ought to have a choice of Uncle Sam a government insurer. And that way you can choose a government insurer if you want to. Well, Congressman not Barr ought to undermine the private insurance. <clears throat> you know what it would do? It would force the private for-profit insurance companies to now compete with a government plan that is non-profit. But, Thereby, it, but then would it lead to a single payer system? No, it because wouldn't of because of they would have to bring down their prices and we could have more choice within the Affordable Care Act exchanges. And Congressman Barr ought to love this because he's all for more choice for people. So this, when you talk to people who are Republicans and Democrats, they like this plan. It okay. gives people more opportunity and more choice. We should have okay. done this yesterday. R Renee, there's a lot there, if I could, if I could. Uh, I'd like to respond to a lot of what she said about the, uh, uh, the replacement plan, which is false. But I want to focus on what she just is advocating right now. Because when she first got into this race, she said in her own words, and there's been conversation about um, us taking words out of context. What she said in context was that single payer is the way to go. That universal social, socialized medicine is awesome. That's, her, that's, her, way, that's, her, that's her in her own words. That's her in her own words. And when she got to this district, she was unfamiliar with this district. She didn't realize that this district wasn't as liberal as she is. And so she said that not knowing that people would bristle at that. And so she modified her viewpoint and she said, oh, well, now I'm for a Medicare buy-in and for a public option. So I want you to I'm going to respond. If I could, if I could, let me finish my thought. Let me finish my thought and then I'll be happy to engage further. But then she modified her position. She said she was for a public option. Let me tell you what a public option is. Public option is single payer on a delayed fuse because anybody in the private health insurance marketplace will tell you, and our, our Department of Insurance Commissioner will tell you as well, that you cannot operate an insurance marketplace with a taxpayer subsidized option that is operating at a loss subsidized by the taxpayer. The, the, the exchange plans right now, there's all, because of Obamacare, there's only one exchange plan left. There's no choices. There's one choice. 
in the, in, the, in the exchange. And they're unattractive. They're high premiums, high deductible, and they have narrow networks. So let me have and so if I could, please if I could answer just, the criticism. If I just, just could, real quickly, I have 10 to, more I have seconds. To finish, I have to finish the point really seconds, quickly. 10 more seconds, please, Congressman And so, and so what, what it is, is that it, it, the market will end up being a monopoly, and it is single payer. Okay. It, will, it, will be, it will be single payer, and guess what? That means a dramatic shortage of doctors, and a no innovation, and a $32 trillion increase in spending. Ms. McGrath, okay. your rebuttal then Mr. Harris. Yeah, thanks. Um, a lot of lies there. Uh, you know, Congressman Barr loves to take my words out of context. This is a positive context. campaign. This is um, a positive campaign calling me a liar. Are you done? Um, likes to take words out of context. What I said was, you know, I was a military officer. I was under military medicine, um, which I guess is socialized medicine. And you know what? Um, I liked it. It kept me uh, strong enough and healthy enough to be a United States uh, Marine Corps officer and a fighter pilot for 20 years. Um, and to serve my country. And so, you know, I just, that's the context of what I said. Now, going forward in terms of public policy, you know, going to a single payer system, I've said from the start, and anybody that's been watching the primary knows that um, I don't think that that is the way to go. We already have a system, it's a complex system, and it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. Let's get people elected to Congress who are not bought off by the insurance companies. Let's get people in, who work for Congress, in, in the Congress, who want to fix our system and not throw it away for purely political reasons. Mr. Congress, that's what I do I'm need to get about. Mr. Harris in for just a second here. Mr. Mr. Harris, please. Well, I hope I get more than one second because they've had the last five minutes. But You're right. my, my opinion is, and in, in the, the position of the Libertarian Party, is that government intervention has created the crisis we're in today that because we no longer have a free market. We haven't had the free market since at least the 1980s, going back to HMOs. You can trace the rise, the dramatic rise in health care costs and in college education costs directly to government intervention. Government controls today how many doctors, how many nurses, how many healthcare prof professionals are allowed to be trained. They control how many hospitals are allowed to be built. And I've, I've got a, a neighbor and I've talked to many veterans who have gone to the VA. I had an uncle that mm -hmm. served in World War II that went to the VA. VA healthcare is not very good. There's long waits. There's, I mean, drastically long waits. They have to go to a VA center. Why can't vets go to the doctor of their choosing? Why can't they get vouchers to go to any doctor they want? Government intervention is the root cause of the rise in health care. Mr. Harris, I want to ask you this question. This came in from a web form message from Mike Barber in Winchester. He says, I am a Vietnam veteran. The question I have is, what is Congress going to do about the problems we face every day, whether financial or health? So what would you say to Mr. Barber? Well, I would want for the government to allow veterans to go to any doctor they wanted to go to, to go to any hospital they wanted to go to, and be treated in the way they wanted to be treated, not the way the government mandated that they be treated. We need more options. The gentleman Congress will be happy to know that in this term of Congress, we passed the VA Mission Act, which uh, consolidates the community care programs and allows more veterans to go act, to get access to uh, care in the private sector, non-VA providers in the community. But if I could just respond to um, uh, what my opponent said about uh, her health care. What, what, what she had in TRICARE is private health insurance. It's, it's, the, the reason why she liked it is not because it was socialized medicine, but because it was it replicated the employer providing like system. It's like the public option. It's not. It's not. <laughs> a, 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 yeah, it is. No, it, it's absolutely not. It, what it is, it's, pri it's private health insurance. It, the DOD contracts with private insurers like Aetna and United. And, you know, and, 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 wait, Barr, I was actually just, in the military, just, just, I would just, know. Just a minute, here's, here's what it is. It, and, and so you get choices. So if you're a DOD employee, you and your spouse get a choice. You actually get a choice of private health care. My opponent wants everybody else in a single payer system when she gets private health insurance. There's a reason why she liked private Ms. health insurance, her health care, because it was a private plan. Ms. McGrath. I just don't think the Congressman knows anything about what he's talking about. Um, you know, when I was in the military, uh, we did have uh, military medicine. But now that I'm out, I do have TRICARE. And you're right, that's a government insurance option. That's like the private, that's, that's like the public option. No, 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 let me finish. You know, so I just think that he just doesn't understand fundamentally the difference there. Um, but let's get back to, to the veterans to, question. If you will, what, what, what to was the original about question? What would you do if elected to help oh, him right. financially? Help yeah. And, and so, so look. 
I am a veteran. I believe that we should invest in health care for veterans. We owe it to our veterans, to men and women have put themselves on the line, have written Uncle Sam a blank check with their lives. And, you know, how do we do that? We do it by um, investing in the current VA system that we have. I do not believe we should shuffle off our veterans' health care to private insurers who just want to make money off of them. And that's the problem with health care in America today. So when I go to the VA and I, and I go there for my own health care, you know, what I find is we have people doing the job, uh, three people doing the job of 10. That tells me we're underfunded. And while I, I like, you know, the idea of Congressman Barr's uh, uh, Choice Act, the problem is what he's not saying, and this is consistent with Republicans in office and politicians like Andy Barr, is that the stuff's not funded. And so when you, when you don't fund something and you force the VA to do something that's not funded, guess what? They have to take money from other parts of the Veterans Administration and move it around. You're essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so, you know, I'm somebody that wants to actually fund the VA the way it needs to, uh, the way we need to in this country. Renee, that's not true. We did fund the VA Mission Act. And the VA Mission Act, by the way, was a bipartisan bill. It, it's interesting. Whenever she talks about being bipartisan, she seems to be opposing bipartisan bills because she's on the extreme far left. The, the, only the extreme far left of the Democratic Party opposed the VA Mission Act. The VA Mission Act was a bipartisan effort in many respects. And you know what? Even many Democrats work with us on choice in the veteran. And by the way, the VA Mission Act was bipartisan because we did invest in the VA. We invested in retention of doctors and nurses. We invested in a totally re total review of the VA infrastructure to invest more, not just in the Choice Act or opportunities for community care, but also in the VA itself. And by the way, competition and choice creates excellence even in the VA. And, and my legislation that is a bipartisan bill, the Military Save Act is a great example of that, to give Survive, this came out of a constituent, survivors of military <clears throat> sexual trauma, access to the prov providers of their choice who can give them the care for their unique needs. That passed the House, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, was, helped me with this, a, a Democrat from Hawaii, Hawaii National Guard. And guess what? The VA responded and they became a better provider for that unique issue of military sexual trauma because we were providing choices and options and competition for the VA. Any comment on that, Ms. McGrath, before I move no, on? Uh, this question from, from Tim Kelly, former AARP National Board member, who brings up the question about Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And we know that uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said in mid-October that uh, the real drivers of the debt uh, are Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. So when we hear that, many people say that means those programs are going to be cut. Uh, Congressman Barr, what do you know about a plan to reduce those entitlement programs? And is that one way to pay? for the federal tax cut plan that passed and possibly future revisions of that tax plan that would make some of those tax cuts permanent. Well, let me first say that because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that I supported and that my opponent wants to take away and repeal, the hospital insurance Part A of Medicare, the trustees of Medicare have, have said that we've extended the solvency of Medicare a year later to, from 2025 to 2026. Why? Because the primary mechanism to pay that we pay for Medicare is through the payroll taxes. There are more people working. There's more people paying taxes, payroll taxes. And therefore, Medicare solvency has been extended because of tax cuts. Um, the other point is that my opponent's plan is a Medicare buy-in program. What the trustees of Medicare tell us is that over, over the next uh, several years, next several decades, Medicare has an unfunded liability of $40 trillion. My opponent's plan is to add trillions in obligations to a, a program that already has $40 trillion in unfunded liabilities. If you are an existing senior on Medicare, watch out if Lieutenant Colonel McGrath's plan gets into place okay, because, McGrath, because you're gonna have you to a comment? massive shortage of doctors in Medicare. Sure. This is um, what the Republicans typically do and your standard politicians will stay up there and they'll say, you know, um, I really care about Medicare and Medicaid. And then the, what they do when they get uh, power in office is um, they, ta they, they pass this enormously bad tax scam for the American people, um, giving 83% of the benefits to the wealthiest 1% in corporations, adding two trillion, trillion with a capital T, not billion, trillion to the national debt. And when Congressman Barr ran for office, he said his number one priority, number one, 
was to get our deficit and debt under control. And the only major piece of legislation, the only major piece of legislation that he's been able to pass with the Republican majority is adding $2 trillion to the national debt. Now, you mentioned it yourself. Now that we're here, uh, the Republican majority leader in the Senate has said, well, how are we going to pay for this? Well, we're going to have to look at Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and go after them. And this is the problem. You know, we can afford to take care of our elderly. It's about values. People pay into this system. They pay into Medicare. They pay into Social Security. You know, this is... To me, this is, we've got to keep the promises that so we... So if the Democrats were to gain control of the mm -hmm. House of Representatives and they were to call for a repeal of the federal tax cuts, would you take those $2,000 well, that I'll many middle-class Kentuckians are enjoying out of their pockets? I'll tell you what, I would, I would most certainly look at corporations and the wealthiest 1%. And because, you know, they have been the number one... Um, beneficiaries of this quote booming economy that Congressman Barr keeps talking about. You know, everywhere I go, people don't want to work three jobs to make ends meet. When we have Kentucky school teachers, Hope, who's in Versailles, who has to work three jobs to make ends meet, I mean, this is, this is the problem. And the idea that, that Congressman Barr would say, hey, my tax cuts are so great, they're going to pay for themselves, and all on top of it, all these wages are increasing. You know, that's just not true. Wages have been stagnant for years. It's a problem that Renee. goes back well beyond this Renee. administration. Wage growth is on the increase. Not, not very much. R not enough in, 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 in comparison Renee. to inflation. It's not. And that's the major problem. Renee, there's a lot there. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep adding trillions. And frankly, Frank would agree with me. You can't, can't keep adding trillions to our national debt Renee, to please our donors. Renee, if I, if I could, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Uh, let me first just say that for someone who, who, who prides herself in being trustworthy, to say that's my only legislative accomplishment is is a little bit hypocritical, a lot hypocritical, because we passed multiple bills, including a bipartisan bill to increase Americans' access to the financial system, a bipartisan bill to increase access to manufactured housing, bipartisan legislation to provide addiction recovery and transitional housing and job training for uh, opioid addiction. Yes, the tax cuts bill, but there's a whole range of other legislative, the VA Mission Act, the 21st Century Cures Act. Can you there's, get to the point but, about but the, the federal point, tax cut the, the, plan the, the, the point is, debt. she needs, uh, my opponent, has not read the most recent CBO. She's, she, she apparently has read a CBO projection that is based in fantasy, untethered to economics, but before the tax cuts that projected not two trillion, but a $1.6 trillion score for the tax cut plan, uh, a static score. The, the reality is, the reality is that, that in August, the CBO has revised, after the tax cuts are in, in effect, revised its score and projected that because people have changed their behavior, because there's more jobs, because it, we're at historic unemployment, because there's, we're at a booming economy, there's more taxpayers, the economy is going to grow $6 trillion more because of tax cuts. And guess what that means? An additional $1.1 trillion in revenue as a result. Here's the fact. Renee, in 2018, with the tax cuts, there's more revenue to the federal government than there was in last year without the tax cuts because of more growth, because of more taxpayers. And in terms of the, the distributional effects of this tax cut, two points. Number one, we repealed the individual mandate. 85% of the, of the tax of individual mandate applies to people with less than $50,000 a year. She wants to reimpose that on low-income Americans who can't afford it. We, we doubled the child tax credit. We provided, a, this tax plan gives the average middle-income family in the 6th District over $2,000 less. That's not for the top 1%. And finally, if you look at the distributional effects of this, the, 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 the top 20% before the tax cuts went into effect, paid 84% of all federal income taxes. After the tax cuts, they pay 87%. Okay. The, the bottom 60% of taxpayers went from 5.3% down to 4.3%. We made the tax code more progressive. Mr. Harris, comment here on uh, the debt and federal tax cuts. If you notice, I have not been getting a whole lot of airtime on here. So those of you that want to hear my complete answers on all the questions, including the ones I'm not being asked, please go to my website, www.votefrankharris.com. 
I'll have more complete answers to all these questions on my website within 48 hours. So in general, on the debt, I was wrong in the interview that Renee and I did that we taped last week. 7% um, of all the money that we spend in 2018 is going toward interest on the debt. That figure is project, projected to triple over the next eight or nine years. The debt will eventually consume more and more of the budget to the point where it overtakes spending on everything else. Right now, interest on the debt is the number four item on the pie chart of the total budget behind Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Interest, as interest rates climb and as the debt itself climbs, is only going to increase. The Trump budget's going to be a, a shortfall of at least one and a half trillion dollars. The Republicans have not done what they said they were going to do to balance the budget. They will not do what they and, said they were going to Mr. do Harris, to balance the budget. this question to you from Jesse Green or Jess Green in Jessamine County. As a younger voter, she says, I'm extremely concerned about the mounting debt that both parties have been responsible for. How would you, as a libertarian, work to tackle the budget deficit? Something specific. Give me three, two to three specific points, please, I, sir. I will be very glad to. This is also on my website. So in my world, it's very simple. First, you have to pay down the debt. The debt's growing. So what I would do first is pay down 2% of the debt every year. That would be approximately $400 billion. So you take that first from whatever revenues you have. You use last year's revenues as your figure, not projected revenues, because projected revenues are always overly optimistic. Andy would probably agree with that. And, and so... First, you pay down the debt, you take whatever money you have left, and you apply it to whatever you think you need. If, you, if the Democrats and the Republicans can't agree on what to cut, then you have to cut everything proportionally. It's, it's the only way to do it. Can I say something about the deficit? Please, uh, look, I did run for Congress to reduce the deficit, and my record is very clear. I voted for a balanced budget every term I've been in Congress. I voted to, I've, and I've been, received criticism for this. I have, I have voted against disaster relief bills because it was, it was full of pork. Uh, I have voted. I have voted to reform mandatory spending programs. I, I, I voted for the, the bill that she, that my opponent criticizes, is that was the single biggest entitlement reform uh, in history that would have seriously addressed the long-term drivers of the national debt, which is in mandatory autopilot pilot spending. But we will never balance the federal budget if we don't have robust economic growth. And in the previous eight years before this administration, we were growing at less than 2%. We are growing twice okay. as fast now. Very good. And we will be able to balance the budget much better. But what's driving it is not tax cuts. It's, as, as Frank pointed out, it's, it's increasing interest rates, which is increasing debt service costs, and runaway mandatory spending, which is outstripping the additional revenue and from growth. And mandatory spending, meaning yeah. Medicare, Social Security, and, Medicaid. Yeah, Can and I just respond? And, 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 Thank and, you. And welfare. Yep. Yep. And welfare. So from this year to from last year to this year, under Republican uh, rule, shall we say, um, the deficit has increased 17 percent, 17 percent because of your tax cuts for the wealthiest in corporations. So, you know, here, here's the other thing. You, you won't give disaster relief for people who are affected by wildfires in California and floods in Texas, but you have $15 billion to give back to your corporate donors and to the wealthiest 1%. You know, this this is what it comes. This is why I'm running. I'm tired of this. We need a new generation of leaders who can stand up and 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 lead this country and not be flat out puppets of their political party and of their big corporate donors. This is the problem. It, it is going to hurt us. The debt and the deficit is absolutely going to hurt us. And, you know, I just don't think that we can pay for it on the backs of hardworking individuals who paid into Medicare and are expecting Social Security for the elder part of their lives. And it's, it's just completely hypocritical that Congressman Barr would do this. And you know what? I'm not opposed to tax cuts. If Congressman Barr cares so much about middle class and working class tax cuts, he would have made those permanent. He didn't. He didn't. Yes, did. He made it permanent yes, for I corporations in the world. And, and there was and, a vote yeah, recently. Yeah, that you not, only, not, only recently, not only recently, but, but my initial vote. You, it's my initial, priorities, no, Congressman. No, my, it's priorities. You would if, have made if it I a could, priority. If I could respond, if I could respond. The, well, first of all, the idea 
that my opponent is serious or would be serious about the deficit is about as credible, is about as believable as thinking that college basketball fans in this congressional district are going to be, are going to be pulling for Duke next Tuesday night. It's totally unbelievable. This is a I'm can- not the one this that is added a candidate. two trillion this to is the a national candidate. debt. We are raising more revenue. There's more tax collections this year with tax cuts than, than last year, as I said before. But this is a candidate who is proposing a a a healthcare plan that will add $32 trillion in spending over How? the next over the next decade. This is a candidate How who says How can you continue that, to lie? Th- th- this candidate, this is a candidate who says that she supports a Medicare buy-in program that would add trillions in obligations to a program that's already $40 trillion in debt. This is a candidate who sends out to my constituents and to the people of this district a fancy, glossy package of, of new big government pr- pr- spending. It's just not believable that she would be anywhere close to fiscally conservative. (laughs) In contrast, I have voted repeatedly for spending cuts. I have voted repeatedly for balanced budgets. I've co-sponsored the balanced budget amendment. I have voted for GSC reform to to eliminate taxpayer bailouts, the risk of taxpayer bailouts, to reform Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the National Flood Insurance Program. I have voted to reform government and reform spending. And unfortunately, my vote has been in the minority, okay. and so we have Ms. not McGrath, been able to make the progress we need. I want to give you the last word need. on this before we move on to immigration. I mean, the ten minutes remaining. Nobody believes this. I mean, it, it, it's it's first of all, the 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 constant lies. Um, I mean, I, look, I came from an institution where if you lie, cheat, or steal, you're kicked out. And this is one of the reasons I'm running. You know, people who um, get into politics, it seems like standard politicians like Congressman Barr seem to think that honor and integrity can be, you know, you can just throw them out the window in order to win your seat. Um, You know, the the idea, again, I am not for socialized medicine. I've never uh, been for socialized medicine. And the fact, you know, when you continue to bring up these lies, it's like you're dishonest to Single payer is the way to go. That is her in her own words. We know she wants to go there because in her interview with Matt Jones, she said it in her own words. She said we need to move in that direction. We've already talked about that quite extensively. We need to move in that direction in her own words. Hold on to your wallets. Thank you, Congressman Barr, for clarifying (laughs) for that. Uh, This uh, question web form from Carolyn Akers, before I get to immigration, from Woodford County. Agriculture is a major part of this congressional district. What would either candidates do to support farmers and agricultural community as a whole? Ms. McGrath, I'll begin with you. Well, the first thing that we need to do is elect people who have the backbone to stand up to this president um, with regards to the tariffs. You know, the tariffs are hurting a lot of our industries here in Kentucky 6. Uh, they're hurting the bourbon industry. They're hurting um, the Toyota and the automotive industry. Uh, just a couple days ago, I talked with Mary, who is uh, somebody that works in arts and crafts, and she, her raw, raw materials have gone up 35%. She's going to worry about her um, job right now, but the, one of the biggest folks that they're hurting is our farmers, um, particularly our soybean farmers, who have uh, essentially lost their markets um, because of the president's uh, tariffs. Look, folks, nobody wins a trade war. And um, so one of the things that we need to do is to elect leaders who don't just sit there and say, well, I'm for free trade, but I'm really only for free trade when my when my president of my political party is for it. You know, when he comes out with these disastrous tariffs, I'm just going to cave and um, and turn and look the other way and be a, a, a puppet of my party. And so that's not something you'll get from me. I'm not owned by a political party. Um, I ran this campaign because I believe we need a new generation of leaders. And one of the things I want to do is stick uh, stand up to the president on these tariffs. Are you standing up to the president on these I, tariffs, I am, and, and I, I absolutely am. I'm a co-sponsor of a bill that the administration opposes, which is the Global Trade Accountability Act. But let me say this. I support the objectives of this administration. Absolutely. China has been ripping us off in this country for years. And finally, we have an administration that wants to get to the right place. Better trade deals, reciprocal free tra- <coughs> trade deals. Um, but I have been advocating for our farmers. I've been advocating for our farmers with tax cuts. I'm a, I was given the, the Friend of Farmer Award for a reason, because they, su- they, su- they support what I support, which my opponent wants to repeal, which is a 100% expensing, which is re- which is doubling the exemption for the for the estate tax, which is expanding access to credit through my bipartisan legislation to provide relief to community financial institutions, which provide 90% of the agricultural loans to our farmers today. They support the work that I'm doing, the farmers do, for that reason. And I'm also working on tariffs with this administration, not just weighing in, but actually advocating for legislation, the Global Trade Accountability Act, which would give Congress ultimate authority 
over uh, tariffs and, tr and trade deals. And, 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 and final, final point here is that my opponent, if she was elected, would have zero influence, zero influence with okay. this administration. Thank you for that point. Mr. Harris. Uh, Andy touched on tariffs, and libertarians are definitely against tariffs. Tariffs hurt the tax or, or the consumer. Uh, nobody, like Andy said, wins in the trade war. Uh, but there's a false narrative being portrayed about China that <clears throat> somehow we're being ripped off by China. We benefit greatly from cheap Chinese labor, cheap Chinese products, and we should be counting ourselves lucky that the Chinese are still willing to take a U.S. dollar that is being greatly devalued because of overprinting of the U.S. dollar. The fact that we use a fiat currency that is not backed by anything is going to lead to the ruination of America. We're going to see it within our lifetimes, and this is something we haven't talked about. We also haven't talked about our foreign policy, our over-involvement in the Middle East, our occupation and bombings of other countries, and the fact that we were lied to to get us into Iraq, we were lied to to get us into Vietnam, we're currently being lied to get us into Syria and to try to uh, create tension between increased tensions between us and Russia. Okay, so let me ask you real quickly on, since we're on foreign policy, about Afghanistan. Uh, earlier this year, the Pentagon said that the Afghan war is costing American taxpayers $45 billion this year. It's considered America's longest war. Should we continue to be there or bring the troops home? Absolutely not. We have no business being in Afghanistan. We would not be in Afghanistan if it weren't for the rare earth elements and other things that we need for our cell phones and our electronics. We wouldn't be in the Middle East if it weren't for oil. So we're also being given a false narrative about why we're in the Middle East, about it being about terrorism. It's always about resources. Wars are always about resources and about global domination. Our founding fathers did not want this. They wanted us to be the shining city on the hill. They did not want us to be the biggest bully on the block. A question about, I'm not going to get to immigration, so I apologize for that. Election integrity. Uh, do you believe there's a crisis of confidence in American democracy when it comes to voting, particularly <clears throat> considering that we have understood that foreign Actors have been involved in using social media to interfere with the U.S. elections. What would you do about that, Congressman Barr? Very quickly, one minute or less, please, well, I would, sir. Well, I would certainly support the administration's efforts to counter Russian aggression. We finally have an administration that stood up to Putin's ally Bashar al-Assad in Syria. We have, uh, we're doubling the European Deterrence and Re Reassurance Initiative. We are uh, actually supporting uh, NATO and our collective defense there by requiring and asking our, our NATO allies uh, to, to, uh, d to in increase their, their commitment to, to military spending to 2% of their gross domestic product. We are actually countering Russian aggression by kicking out uh, the diplomats from the United American States. What about American aggression, Andy? What so, about American aggression? So, so just, this, so has just America to finish, been aggressive so, so overseas? Quickly, sir, 30 more seconds on your answer, so, please. So just, to, so just to finish the point, I'm, as the chairman of the subcommittee with jurisdiction <coughs> over sanctions, I not only supported sanctions against Russia for their interference in our election, but I support even enhanced sa sanctions against Russia. And uh, Th Does Russia have to bases in 130 further, foreign man, countries? For, for, America's got bases in 130 countries. Russia doesn't. How would we feel if Russia had bases in Mexico and in Canada? That's what we're doing around the world. We've got bases surrounding Russia, surrounding Iran. Ms. McGrath, election integrity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned. Uh, we, we were essentially attacked, cyber attacked by um, Russia. They've done this to other countries um, in Europe from our elections in 2016. They're doing it again. The um, person who is the head of our national security agency, has a, Admiral Rogers, has essentially said that uh, we could be doing more. We should be doing more. I'm very concerned uh, that this administration, particularly the president, uh, wraps his arms around dictators. And, you know, while uh, Congressman Barr might talk about his legislation with uh, Russian sanctions or, or North Korea, the fact is um, he's incapable of standing up to the president as he wraps his arms around Kim Jong Un and uh, calls him his um, friend. And I just, Shouldn't I'm, we be I'm talking actually to shocked Korea and about trying it. to de-escalate tensions? So, We've occupied Korea I, for 50 years. I'm all for when, talking. When but, can we come home? But, when can we can, when can we come home from Germany? When can we come home from Japan? We've been over there for 70 years. 
We can't afford these wars anymore. We need to bring our troops home from around the world. So last question of the evening, with just two minutes and 55 seconds remaining, one minute apiece for each of you. Uh, what kind of Kentucky do you want to leave your grandkids? Uh, Mr. Harris, should you be elected to represent the 6th Congressional District in Washington? I would love to leave a Kentucky that didn't have to fear its own government. We're working toward a cashless society and a, and a government controlled healthcare system, which will be used to control the population. It's that simple. Our own government wants to not only dominate the world military, militarily, they want to control us, their own citizens. The NSA is spying on every phone call you make, on every email that you send, Andy Barr has voted to allow the TSA to do these things to its own people. When I first Congress ran, Barr. thank you. When I first ran for Congress, I made a commitment to restore the American dream, and we are keeping that promise, and we are getting results. And because of our policies in Washington, tax cuts for the middle class, because of deregulation, because of uh, reforms, bipartisan reforms, I've led to increase Americans' access to financial services and products because of the work we're doing on the on medical research and on fighting the opioid ed epidemic and rebuilding our military and giving our troops their first pay raise in a decade. America is back. The American people are better off now. My, okay. my, my, my uh, final word to Ms. McGrath here. Sure. Seconds remaining. What I really want is for my uh, kids to grow up in a Kentucky where they have leaders that um, will always put their country above their political party, will always do um, the right thing. And we need to invest um, in education for our children. We need to invest in infrastructure here in the 6th District um, so that 20 or 30 years from now, we're competitive in the world. And that means rural broadband. Uh, it means, you know, making sure we fix our 20th century infrastructure and going and making sure that we have 21st century infrastructure. And I think that's something that government should do, just like FDR brought electricity to Appalachia. I think these are things that fundamentally leaders do. But the biggest thing is I really believe we need to have leaders who uh, step up from all walks of life and um, be folks that our kids can be proud of and look up to. I think that's the most important thing that this country needs right now. Okay, we're going to have to leave it right there, sir. Thank you all very much. It's been a very rigorous discussion, and we need another hour to get through all the issues. I would but be thank willing. You. I would, too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amy? For being here. <laughs> Join us next Monday when we talk about Election Eve, Election Night on Kentucky Tonight. Don't forget to tune in to Comment on Kentucky with Bill Bryant this Friday at 8, 7 Central. And then our coverage, of course, of the election will happen next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. Thank you very much for watching. We appreciate it. I'm Renee Shaw for KET. Take good care, and I'll see you next week. With the midterm elections just days away, watch the competition for the control of Congress on C-SPAN. See for yourself the candidates and the debates from key House and Senate races. Make C-SPAN your primary source for campaign 2018. C-SPAN's 2018 midterm elections coverage continues with debates from races across the country. Next, the Vermont Senate debate.